welcome everyone. Um, so we have uh, the following agenda items, and um, we'll go over those briefly. And then, uh, if there's any other items that people think they need added, let's discuss that initially. So the first is going to be uh, an update on the white paper working group um, from Dave. Um, and Dave, you're on, right? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. Um, and then we'll follow, and, th and that'll be, I think, fairly brief, right, Dave? Um, just a sort of call to action. And, um, Absolutely. <laughs> and, and then there's, uh, I think, I'd, I'd like to see if we can't sort of close out on the code of conduct, Arno. Um, I mean, we may not be able to, and maybe we have to wait until the face-to-face -face finally to get it resolved, but uh, Arno will lead a discussion on the code of conduct and where we stand there. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll kick off, but I think uh, Tomash and the DAH team may also have uh, uh, some content for proposed discussion of you know some of the top level stories that we would uh, work on at the face to face. Um, and again, we can we can get into if you know if people think there are other ideas that, that that they may have that they like to pursue as experiments for next week. We can we can certainly discuss that. And then we probably should make sure that we um, uh, have a discussion on the, the full uh, sort of uh, agenda for the face-to-face, -face, although I kind of expect that we'll have different tracks. There'll be a, probably a development track, pardon me, um, there'll probably be a, um, uh, a requirements and, work, and uh, use cases working group track and then a, a white paper track. If we need one, I guess the code of conduct track on it. Um, then uh, Steve with Moreland is going to get on and talk about um, the support services that the Linux Foundation can provide us from a continuous integration and, and you know, from an IT perspective. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And uh, and then we'll have, uh, if we have time. Uh, an update from Patrick on the requirements working group, although he, he may not have been expecting this, but um, again, I, if, if we have time, you know, we'll just get an update on where, where things stand there. Um, anything else? Okay. If not, then... Uh, Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, um, you know, talk a about this a little bit. So yes, I, am, I volunteered as to be the editor of, of the white paper, and of course the editor is not the author. Um, and uh, uh, but you know, when I first signed up for this, I was like, oh yeah, you know, we've we've all reviewed the OBC white paper, and as an editor, I could go in and do a global replace of Open Blockchain with Hyperledger. Um, but I guess you know that isn't exactly appropriate, and, and, and you know Chris and I talked about this a little bit before, and you know Chris laid out a, um, a nice uh, sort of a, an outline for for the white paper, and so uh, to the extent that you know, well, we're we're all getting together next week, um, and as, as Chris just mentioned, you know, we're going to be um, organized into some kind of tracks, and and uh, it certainly makes sense to have a track. On the white paper, make sure it reflects what we all agree is, you know, a little bit more of the detail of, of what our, you know, our charter and mission is um, for for this project. So, um, so I'll be looking to, you know, kind of lead that. We're definitely going to need some uh, people to participate, uh, and and also, you know, it's important to also recognize that, you know, this white paper. And if you read through the, I, I definitely encourage everyone to please read through the the IBM one because I, that's the one that, that has been submitted. Um, and if and if anyone would like to have you know another version um, to be submitted as well, then you know that this would be a great time to get it out there. But um, you know it does cover things like uh, use cases, industry use cases, and featured requirements. Um, and before it gets into the architecture bit, and to the extent that we're already, you know, organizing a bit around, you know, having a working group um, or track on 
on use cases and, and requirements. It's important that at least at a high level we're capturing the heart of what we're, we're looking to do within the white paper. So this isn't a standalone stream by any means, right? It has to, you know, it, it should almost be coming out of uh, uh, the output from, from the use case and, and requirements working group. So, um, but, you know, it's not going to have the same level of detail. Uh, so, again, I think the, the key thing is to, you know, make sure that what's reflected in here, you know, that we, I, I imagine I, I should probably be sitting, be sitting in on the requirements and use case, you know, discussions as well. <laughs> um, and then having members of those work streams participating in, in the uh, review of the white paper and, and some of the edits. So, you know, that's, those are just a couple of things that uh, we'll be focusing on next week. And, um, and uh, that's, I think that's about it. You know, it's a bit of a call for volunteers to help participate in the actual authoring and, uh, and then uh, ensuring that, you know, um, if, 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 again, just making sure everyone kind of reads through this because I think the, the open blockchain white paper is going to be our template. Um, and uh, and I and I think you know it has it has done a pretty good job of articulating you know the how how this project kind of differs from some of the other projects out there um, and and filling in the gaps you know specifically around you know scalability uh, confidentiality you know privacy and then the fact that you know for for enterprise type of use cases. Uh, Many of them are going to be operating in in a sort of a regulated industries, so there are some real requirements around that. Those are the I think the the big three things that we want to make sure are are well captured within the white paper, so people can read through this and and understand a little bit better. So um, I mean that's just pretty much all I wanted to say at this stage. Uh, you know we will be forming um, you know a, a breakout group or a track uh, around this. And we need to make sure that you know what is coming out of the use cases and requirements uh, discussions uh, are at, at least at a high level are captured within in the white paper. Hey Dave, this is Mike. Um, how do you want feedback on that? Um, we had sent around some feedback on the IBM white paper earlier. Um, do you want that incorporated into like a Google Docs comments or? Um, what would be the yeah, best I, way to provide some of that? Yeah, I, I think Google Docs is, you know, since we're we're using that for pretty much everything else, I, you know, I think that would work here. Unless anyone has any other recommendations. Yeah, that would be that would be my recommendation is that um, capture the the comments uh, it, it as comments on the Google Doc, and you know, if you have suggested edits, obviously, you know, I would say, you know, go for it. Dave, I, mean, I think you're, most you're, of our you're editing, right? So, um, I mean, you know, whatever tends tends to work best. I think you know, uh, if it, if it becomes too crazy, then you may want to sort of, um, you know, keep it that that you're the one that that actually does the actual editing, and people put in comments, and you accept them, reject them, and tweak them, and so forth. But um, it can also work if, if there's not too many people stepping on each other. To, to have people just suggest that it's yeah, uh, I think that would be uh, a good way to start off, um, and then uh, suggest the edits. I'll put them in there um, if if I think there's something that needs to be a you know a broader discussion around that particular suggestion. Then you know we'll just and again I think you know we can table some of that. Uh, to the to the face to face next week, so that will be easier to discuss in a in a quorum. But you know, getting started with the uh, Google Docs and the comments in there, and I think that that would be the right way to go. Okay. So um, there, there was a question Charu asked in the chat: um, how to get access to the white paper? It's in the IBM uh, proposed contribution, um, and uh, so I will I'll send a. a a link to the, to the mailing list, um, but the actual white paper um, is a pull request 
currently the links that Mike pasted in the chat. Uh, that's the outline. <clears throat> Oh, thanks, Vipin. Um, I don't have to do that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dave. Any yeah, questions? Thanks. If not, then uh, let's transition to Arno. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. So, code of conduct with the survey monkeys going on. Um, the initially it was a really close race, and then things settled down a little bit. I think at this point there are 64 votes that were cast, and um, there is. A, it seems to indicate a preference for the W3C based uh, draft that I put together. Uh, it's not a landslide by any means, but uh, there are two indicators that tell me we should go with the W3C one because. There is a majority of people who think they prefer W3C, but maybe more importantly, there are more people who do not want the Cloud Foundry-based one. There are five people who said they disagree with using that, while only one person disagreed with using W3C-based uh, code of conduct. So, <clears throat> based on that, and I, you know, and uh, you probably saw, I sent a couple of email asking for explanation about why. People disagreed. I thought that could be useful. We may be able to address some of this, but I didn't really get any response. So I'm in a bit of in the dark as to why people feel so strongly that they disagree with a particular option. But in any case, I think at this point, as it's been said, uh, the goal is not to make this a whole project in and of itself. It's just to have a code of conduct that we can use and move on. And so I would uh, suggest the TSC decides to adopt the W3C based draft, at least as a starting point. There may be a couple of things that could be added to the code of conduct. There is a Alan asked that we put a point on uh, staying focused, that's in the um, staying on topic, that is in the Cloud Foundry one, which we could leverage and put in the, in the W3C based one. And there's another one that I had pointed out last week, which is the step down considerably, uh, considerately. Um, and it has to do with, you know, telling people, if you leave the project, just don't drop the ball and disappear. Try to make sure that things get transitioned properly and that somebody is going to be able to take over. And so this was another aspect that I had seen in the Cloud Foundry-based Cloud Foundry one that is not in the W3C one. So if we adopt the W3C base draft, I think these are two points we could possibly add to this to make it maybe the best merge kind of thing that uh, we could uh, all uh, in, in live with. So, I don't know if there's any questions other than that. So thanks, Arno, I think that analysis um, makes a lot of sense, certainly to me. Um, I, I I can't remember now, Todd. We have a quorum, right? So we do. Maybe yes. if we could just quickly pull the the TSC members and uh, get their input, and uh, maybe at least an agreement that okay, so the W3C is our base, and you know, maybe sort of suggest to Arno that. Um, you know, he pursues the, the couple of you know thoughts that people had on the uh, in the comment, and, and you know, actually, I think you know, come to think of it, I mean, I was I was hoping we could get it settled by by today, um, but maybe if it just needs one more edit edit pass, if we could just sort of say, okay, let's just focus on the W3C one based on the fact that there are more people who disagree with the Cloud Foundry base. And um, uh, and and also more people who prefer the W3C one. That you know maybe it makes sense to sort of uh, consolidate our efforts around just finalizing over the course of the next week. Um, so to try to expedite this, if I may, uh, my suggestion yeah. would be that we put a proposal before the TSC today to adopt the W3C based draft amended with two additions that I just talked about. 
the stay on topic uh, aspect and the uh, step down considerately. If people can agree to this, I can make the edits and we're done. That would be cool. I think so too. <laughs> so, Todd, you want to do a roll call and just sort of get the TSC members to weigh in? Yep, sure thing. So for the TSC members on the call, um, I'll just uh, go in order. So Stan from CME Group. Um, I'll agree with the W3C. CSE. All right, sounds good. Uh, Stefan from Deutsche Börse. Stefan, you may be on mute. All right, we can come back to Stefan in a second. Uh, Hart from Fujitsu. Hart, are you there? All right, we'll come back to Hart as well. Uh, Chris? Yeah. That's a yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, great. Mick from Intel? Yes. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Dave from JP Morgan? Yes. All right. Richard from R3? Uh, Abstain. I've got, I've got no strong view either way at all, so I'm, I'm happy not to cast a vote. All right. Sounds good. Um, and then Stefan or Hart, uh, if you're talking, you're on mute. Or if you want to type in the chat window as well. So I don't know if they stepped away or. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not certain uh, either. Um, and then just checking of the other four TSC members is Oshima-san, uh, Parda, Tomas, or Emmanuel on the call. Hey, um, but so Parda isn't isn't there. But uh, this is Morali from DDCC. Does he have to cast the vote, or can we do on his behalf? How does that work? Todd, maybe you could unmute Art. He's trying to speak or trying to unmute. Yeah, uh, Parda would need to, to cast the vote or would, would have needed to provide proxy before the call. Um, okay. And then it looks like Hart is on mute. So Hart, let me see if I can unmute you. Hmm. Hart, are you there? Hey, Todd, sorry about that. Um, I'm fine with the W3C code of conduct. Um, I thought the definitions were a little bit much, but you know, it's just a code of conduct. We're not writing the Constitution here, so I'm fine with going ahead with that. All right, thank you. Hi, Stefan here. I seem to be unmuted now. I'm fine as well. All right, sounds good. Uh, so, Chris, from the TSC members on the call, we have seven TSC members. Six of them are in favor and one abstaining. Okay. Um, well then, let's, let's let's go with that. Um, I mean, we, we we're open source. We can <laughs> we can submit a pull request. So, um, I I say uh, Arno, go for it. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, so we have a COC. <laughs> so I guess uh, Arno, if you could edit that. Uh, make those edits, and then Todd. I guess we should figure out how to link that in uh, to the Hyperledger project page. Okay. Um, so 
the technical face-to-face, -face, uh, I sent around a deck that uh, hopefully captures. And actually, Todd, you're going to present that. Yep, it should be up now. There we go. Okay. So I I sent this out uh, to the list, and uh, again, apparently the list archive. Uh, does not archive attachments, so I also posted it to the Slack chat. Yeah, um, I really need to figure out a, a consistent way that we can just post documents. Um, I don't know if we need a box account or a Dropbox or something. Um, maybe Steve can talk about the next item. Here's my proposal. Um, we would start the morning uh, with an introduction to uh, the various code bases, um, DAH and, and, and IBM, uh, based on the proposal that we're going to be uh, working on as an experiment. Um, then we have a little bit of a show and tell, and I'll talk a little bit about in, in a second about uh, about that, or maybe she and if you're on, maybe you could do that. Um, and then we've outlined some potential projects now. Um, Dimash, I was hoping was going to be joining us this morning because he also has maybe a little bit more specificity in terms of some of these projects. But, uh, um, uh, maybe you could just uh, uh, do a voiceover of what uh, the DEH proposal had suggested. Um, and then um, so, so we would so do that, outline the potential projects and at the face-to-face -face itself, where we would get into a little bit more specificity, and and people could start thinking about what they wanted to work on. You know, which of those uh, sort of sub-projects that they, they thought they might want to do. Um, then I thought at noon we could have a brown bag to make sure that everybody can get their development environment set up. Um, so we would go through the the process of um, uh, of uh, you know installing all the bits and pieces of Vagrant and VirtualBox and so forth, and actually getting your, you know, people's development environments up and running so that when they do changes, they can run the test and so forth. Um, and then uh, we would start at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, and go to the rest of the day and, and through Thursday at the end of the day uh, with the hackathon itself. And again, this is this is just the, the, the sort of the development track, if you will, and we'll have separate tracks for the requirements and, and, and uh, white paper. And if we want, maybe we just have one track for that and we can, um, you know, split some of the time uh, between the two different uh, parts of the group. Um, and then uh, I, I thought what we could do on Friday would be then to have a retrospective about what, you know, um, what people thought of the week. Um, you know, this is this is typical of uh, any kind of good agile process is to hold a retrospective, and so we, you know, the the morning we would hold a retrospective, and then we'd start thinking about you know where we go from here. Um, and so that's the, the very high level agenda I had for um, the technical, you know, for the development track. Uh, any thoughts on this before I get into the or before I have she and get into the specifics? Hey, um, hey, Chris. This is Morali from DDCC. Had a quick question. Sure. So, yeah, in terms of the dev environment, just want to make sure because these are company-provided laptops. Is Windows fine, or are we expecting on uh, Mac or Mac or Ubuntu? So we actually talked about that. Um, uh, so, our, our, I think all of our instructions are oriented around a Mac. Uh, this, I, this is Shane. Yeah, win, Windows we find. Um, yeah, Windows or Linux. We use uh, a Vagrant, so basically uh, Windows, Linux, Mac should all work, and we've all tested them. So you should be able to set up an environment easily on any of those systems. Okay. So we'll be working off. So we'll be working inside the VM of the inside the VM itself, right? Of the Vagrant. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's all in a VM. Is there a Thanks. preference though? Uh, looks like Mac is preferred. Is that right? 
Um, we uh, and we have developers using it on both Mac and Windows, kind of equally. So e either should be okay. In one developer on Linux. So what I would suggest, and actually, um, I think we need to to get uh, and, and send out a reminder of uh, you know how to set up a development environment. Um, maybe we could just send that to the list. Um, but it'd be, I think it'd be valuable to have people uh, at least give it a go uh, sometime between now and Tuesday um, so that we can spend Tuesday noon at the brown bag of just helping people through the last bits. Um, and again, if you have problems, share it on the mailing list and or in Slack and we can, you know, hopefully we can work through some of these things just, um, you know, via email or Slack. But, um, yeah, I think I think, but you know, that so the noon, you know, again would be let's make sure we have everybody who needs to be set up for development to to be set up. Okay, uh, Sheehan, you want to get into some of the specifics of the show and tell and then the the the, uh, the potential projects? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, just a brief introduction. This is the first time I'm on this call. Um, I'm Sheehan Anderson. I'm an engineer. Here at IBM, and I work with uh, Ben, and he had to drop off, so I'm going to be uh, going through this for him. So uh, the the first thing we'd like to do is a show and tell um, uh, for some of the OBC components, and kind of the goal of this is to uh, get people started on their uh, hackathon projects, just answering probably um, some of the most common questions people are going to have. So. Uh, the first one here is uh, OBC has two APIs. Uh, there's a REST API, which is uh, very straightforward, and there's a uh, gRPC API. Um, and well, that's straightforward also. Sometimes, um, if you've never used uh, Google protocol buffers before, it can be a, a bit um, complex to you know compile these and just get set up in your environment with them. Um, so we're going to uh, have a little Java um, sample application um, that will leverage the gRPC API. Uh, we'll make it available somewhere on GitHub and show everyone uh, how you can easily um, communicate with the API, API from the Java application. Uh, the second one, um, we're going to uh, show a, uh, a Bitcoin example. Um, and what that will be is uh, we're going to have a the Java application communicating via gRPC that reads the um, Bitcoin blockchain. It will pass um, transactions over the gRPC protocol to the chain code. Um, the chain code will process the transactions um, using a C library, um, and that. Uh, store them in a uh, UTXO format, and the, the main goal of this uh, is to show kind of how a, a C library could be integrated into the chain code, because we, we know we'd like to integrate um, with uh, a lot of the work that DAH and Blockstream have done, um, you know, so they'll be able to um, help us, like, get their libraries in, but, but the goal is just to figure out how to do this with kind of a uh, generic C library that we chose. And the uh, third show and tell we do, we'll do is um, data warehousing via events. Um, so we know that uh, everyone has a lot of uh, APIs they'd like to be available. Um, and, and some of these APIs can be uh, complex, such as scanning transactions. Um, and our proposal for implementing those more complex queries is that uh, we have an event mechanism that sends out blocks um, and we uh, store these in a data warehouse. Uh, the, the example we'll show will be SQL, but you know, obviously someone could build uh, an additional data warehouse if they wanted and then we'll um, kind of figure out how we can do complex transaction queries against those uh, blocks and transactions and get a sense of uh, what APIs everyone is looking for. Uh, do you have anything to add to the show and tell, Chris, or is that it? 
Hey, I'm next. Muted. I'm muted. Sorry. Um, I think the only thing that I would would add is that this is based on you know some of the work that we've been doing um, to to you know experimenting with to actually start implementing some of what the, the joint DA and IBM proposal had had laid out. So so this is sort of um, uh, you know it's giving the context as you described, but it's also sort of showing the path to to actually fulfilling the the objectives part B of the proposal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next next slide. So <clears throat> these are um, some of the uh, potential community projects we'd like to consider working on. Um, you know, obviously we're not uh, limited to these, but it's just kind of uh, and ide ideas for getting started and things we believe we need. Um, so the, the first one is uh, plugging in uh, the DH and Blockstream interpreters. Um, the, uh, the C library we used was uh, just kind of the lib consensus from Bitcoin. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it would be nice to get experts from DH and Blockstream to figure out how to uh, get their um, transaction interpreters into chain code. Um, the second is making sure that our uh, gRPC APIs, um, and this kind of goes with number three, the data warehouse APIs, provide all the um, APIs that are needed. DAH has a pretty um, extensive uh, list of APIs that they require for their applications. Um, so we'd like to ensure that uh, either we support all of those or build out um, anything that may be missing. Um, the, the fourth one is uh, we, we have pretty extensive um, unit tests and behave tests. If, if you've never used behave before, it's, um, it's a kind of Python tool where you can write um, uh, feature tests in just natural English language. Um, so it's kind of a great way to get started and, and learn, you know, what, what is invoking and querying a chain code um, look like. Even, even if you may not know um, Go or Java or anything, you can just see the basics uh, through these test cases. Uh, number five is um, sample chain codes. Uh, you know, these are just a couple examples, asset management and provenance. Um, you know, I, I guess we'd like to see, you know, we'd like to help people um, get started writing chain codes and see what everyone is looking for and if, you know, some new requirements come out of that. Um, and the sixth one, I was thinking maybe some SDKs around the, the REST API or gRPC APIs if, if anyone's interested in, um, you know, su supporting SDKs for additional languages. Um, could be an interesting project. Um, next slide. Oh, so, so this is just uh, kind of going into each of these in detail, some of which I uh, already covered, so I'll go through these quickly. Um, so this is the, the script interpreter. Um, so uh, like I said, we're, we're starting with kind of the, the Bitcoin interpreter. That's what we've been working with the, the previous couple weeks. Um, and uh, DH and Blockstream have uh, much more advanced uh, interpreters with additional features um, that we'd like to use. And then uh, hopefully we can use this work to uh, plug in, you know, further interpreters that people may be interested in, um, such as, uh, you know, someone mentions uh, Solidity for Ethereum here. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, so the, the gRPC API, um, today uh, our, our main exercise of it is the, the CLI, the command line interface uh, for OBC peer, and we'd, uh, we'd like to explore applications um, written there using the, the gRPC API to, to make sure that uh, it has all the features that are needed. Uh, and the next slide is the uh, data warehouse. So again, this is for the um, more complex queries that we'll have. We'll, we'd like the ledger within o 
OBC to, to mainly be, you know, an OLTP database and that all these um, uh, very uh, complex queries will go out to the data warehouse. And I think this is going to be an exercise in both kind of building the requirements for the API that we need and then figuring out um, how to store the data so that we can uh, perform the correct queries against it. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, and th this is finally the uh, the sample chain code. So, um, you know, I, I think we'll have uh, some basic ones that people can look at to get started. Uh, you know, we'll we'll have some probably basic tutorials that will show you how to write you know a very basic asset transfer one. I, I think the most interesting piece here will be uh, new ideas that uh, people bring to the table of, of what kind of chain codes they need and uh, you know making sure that uh, we can build those without issue. I think that's the last slide. Yeah, so, so are there any questions about this? Okay, uh, and I know um, DH also published uh, a GitHub um, wiki with uh, some goals for the hackathon. I think Tomash is on the call now, and maybe he could discuss those. Yes, uh, excuse me for uh, joining late. I, I missed to recognize that you changed the, changed the time zone over the weekend. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, in in our uh, project, in our project, uh, uh, the AHLP candidate, uh, you find a new file called hackathon.md, and uh, this is basically a, a description of uh, concrete development goals that we would want to uh, achieve during the during the hackathon. Um, they are pretty much in sync to what Sheehan enumerated. Um, basically, we would want to see a working network uh, that people can again play with. A working network that is able to process blocks and stores them into the blockchain of their individual storages and uh, builds a consensus probably with a default algorithm that is in OBC. Um, then we would like to see a structural block API, blockchain API. This API is quite simplistic, even though in this document it might look like lots of functions, but they are very simple functions like get a block, get a transaction, and similar. Uh, they are the very basic functions that all our higher level stack, including our complete use cases, build on. So if, uh, if the Hyperledger would, would support this API, we could basically move on to that stack uh, a huge amount of further work. And uh, I think that this, is, uh, this API could be a value for anybody else uh, looking into this project since this is an API that is proved to be sufficient to uh, create at least use cases or, or satisfy use cases of the financial industry. Um, a further task would be to uh, create a block validator, uh, a block validator plugin um, in uh, OBC, uh, because um, our inheritance from Bitcoin requires not only transaction level validation but also block level validation. Um, if I say validation, think of chain code execution. Um, the uh, in, in, in our UTXO model, um, use chain code to validate a transaction. We do not modify the world state. It is an immutable. Uh, uh, for us, the, the blockchain is just an app and only log that, uh, that is immutable and that doesn't have any side effects, doesn't accumulate the world state. And uh, the next one would be to uh, plug in the interpreters. Uh, um, the blockchain inter uh, the blockstream interpreter for a bitcoin like transaction processor uh, there are a few tasks also enumerated in this document um, and i i thought i think it would be 
would be really fantastic if uh, we would start this uh, work by uh, introducing the stack uh, also or uh, candidate introducing you the experts of, of uh, parts of this code base and uh, thereafter uh, build teams and actually do the work, uh, do a sprint during this hackathon, uh, addressing uh, these tasks. And uh, well, I, I imagine that that uh, people would want to have uh, uh, want to pursue other um, uh, interests uh, during this face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Um, so therefore, I think that we should have uh, side tracks for discussions of uh, uh, requirements and use cases and uh, eventually administrative issues of the project. But uh, the, the primary focus of this gathering should be to get some work done because nothing will make it make this project more successful than producing useful code. I think that's what I want to say about it. Thank you. So, any questions, any comments, any additional think thoughts about you know what, what Tomas was suggesting? Are there other other uh, experiments or projects that people would like to get started on next week? Sounds like this may be a good set there. Is there um, going to be any merging of the code next week uh, at all, or uh, uh, we're just going to work on the two of them independently? So, so I think that, that the intention here is to to drive this experiment and hopefully to come up with okay, so this we're, we're confident that this is something we can go forward with. Um, Unless anybody disagrees with that, I think that's what I'd like to see for next week. Tomash, to others. This is Shin. Yeah, so there there will be um, a merging of the code essentially. Um, you know, so some of the the major uh, merging, for example, will be um, uh, you know merging the uh, OBC with the um, interpreters from uh, DAH and uh, Blockstream. Mm -hmm. So, so at at the end of the week, we're going to have a hyperledger repository code base that from which we can all now be doing pull requests and suggesting new updates and projects but, that, but this will be the goal at the end of the week is okay here it is it's there and we've established it and and that's what we're going to be building on moving forward that's correct right that's the ideal outcome I think Okay. Uh, super. Okay. So, um, any last questions? I think we have. Uh, sounds like we have uh, a good, solid agenda for next week. Um, what I'll do then is I'll put out um, this, and I'll incorporate, you know, the the, the tracks for. Um, the requirements and the and the white paper, and um, and we'll get that circulated uh, or posted someplace. Um, next up is a discussion about um, the services that the Linux Foundation can provide us from an IT perspective that would include continuous integration and and so forth. So, Steve, I think you're on. Hello, folks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, the Linux Foundation uh, IT department uh, basically provides um, a host of, of services to projects. Um, as you guys, uh, familiar, all of you are familiar with Linux, kernel.org, uh, 
we provide the infrastructure and the security surrounding that and its distributions worldwide. Uh, we also do several uh, large projects associated with Linux Foundation, some of which you may work with now. Uh, OpenFE, Open Daylight, uh, more recently announced Open Container, Open Data Platform Initiatives. Um, at its core, our services are, are basically uh, designed to be uh, web services. Uh, what functionality needs to be in you know web mailing list, uh, wiki, those type of functions. Um, we have some flexibility as far as which uh, products get used on that, uh, but we do to typically have recommendations uh, on those that, that scale up. On the CI side, we have some uh, quite large uh, CI infrastructure pieces that we support. Uh, it is typically a, a, a Git, GitHub, Garrett uh, arrangement for the code and the code review. Uh, we support both Travis CI and Jenkins CI functionality. Um, we support a small number of bug management uh, bug tracking uh, functionality. Um, JIRA is probably one of the most prevalent on that part. And some of the configurations are, are very complex in that uh, they need use of multi pool uh, advanced networking functionality or high, uh, high computer, high back plane processing functionality. Um, so the, there's, in those configurations, we dynamically spin up. Um, test systems uh, that use node pool and so on and some of the other CI infrastructure pieces. Um, what we, how we engage uh, is your project gets on the ground, we, we engage with the TSC to, to uh, uh, define that technology stack, stack um, make sure we understand exactly what's needed when. Um, we do have a, a process where uh, we try to go the most cost-effective way. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we don't uh, establish service levels. It just means that uh, in cases where uh, we need to spin up dynamically services, we make use of the best resource we can get hold of, whether it's uh, GC or, or AWS or those sorts of things. Typically, the core portions of the CI or on some hosted managed infrastructure just for stability uh, and uh, security control purposes. Um, key to that is, is in projects this large, there's usually a dedicated uh, release engineer. Um, I call it release engineer instead of release manager because this person's job is to make sure each and every hour of each and every day the CI infrastructure works. Uh, they often are in channel or working with the developers themselves if they get a hang up. Uh, the goal is to smooth that out and slick it out as quick as possible. Uh, and they're always tuning the CI infrastructure uh, to make sure it uh, performs as effectively as it can. Um, so, you know, whether or not uh, the CI infrastructure is going to require, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 VMs to, to be functional, or whether it's going to need 100 to, to 500 VMs to, to accomplish its goals in the right period of time. Uh, you know, those are all things we factor into that sizing. Um, another component of that is we're very familiar with running in multi time zone uh, configurations. Uh, we do, uh, it's not uncommon for us to have a, a presence in uh, North America and their presence in, uh, in Hong Kong for Asia Pacific. And in those cases where uh, things need to be married in mainland China, uh, we have access to services out of Beijing. Um, uh, working in Europe is, is you know, easily done. We typically do services out of either uh, uh, Frankfurt or London. So that's the I guess the, the short list of the, the types of services we provide. Uh, we've done some very preliminary estimates um, based on projects that we think are similar size to you guys, uh, just for budgeting purposes. But I think we've reached a point where uh, uh, we just need to start talking specifics of, of what we think the volume would be, uh, the number of developers accessing the system, and, and specifically what tools need to be done, need to be used.
Are you lost or on mute? So I'm curious, um, so, so we've been actually starting to integrate Travis CI. So you said Travis and, and Jenkins was the other, and you, you know, do, do, do you manage your own Jenkins or do you have the Usually uh, it's typical for us to manage our own, uh, our own instance and our own configuration of those per project. I'm assuming, uh, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming there will be a, a fairly high degree of security associated with this project where um, we don't typically recommend uh, or have situations where developers have root access to the, to the CI infrastructure. Um, you know, that's usually done by our administrators using, you know, using very secure two-factor authentication, credentialized, secure linkages into it. Um, but for projects like like this, projects that that there may be some concern externally that that everything is on the, the up and up, so to speak. Uh, there's usually a, a, a you know mental firewall, if you will, between the administrators and the developers uh, in the infrastructure pieces. I'm curious then, so, I mean, you know, given, you know, sort of that aspect, and I think, you know, one of the things that I think mean, most of us would hope and expect out of this is that this is something that's very robust and very secure. Um, would, would, would that then suggest that we should be looking at something that's completely managed by the LF as opposed to something like Travis where, uh, I, I and again, I'm just sort of trying to understand, you know, from your perspective and from your experience, you know, what the recommendation might be from the, the LF in terms of the, the tool chain that we choose to use. I would like to, 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 to learn a little bit more about, you know, what, what you expect uh, from your development community, what kind of, what we've seen in the past is development communities typically kind of a, a group around certain tool sets. So if if it turns out that 80% of your, your developers, your committers are, are familiar with those tool sets, you know, we'll certainly lean that way. We're confident in securing either either you know a Jenkins configuration or Kratz configuration. That that's something we we're very familiar with doing. So we certainly will have you know, recommendations uh, uh, around it, but at this stage, if you choose either of those two, I think we'd be pretty fine. It would just be a question of a lockdown doesn't need to be. By default, our settings are pretty, uh, are pretty uh, uh, I don't want to say draft coming in, that, that's probably a, a, a step too far, but uh, by default, we, we tend to lock them down pretty, pretty hard. Um, and, and then loosen them up as, as directed by the TSC uh, instead of starting off in a, you know, you know, perhaps a more open configuration. Is development, uh, do, you, do, you, do you folks uh, expect a need for geographical diversity? On the project, or do you think uh, hosting out of North America would, would be? Um, uh, I think we're already. I mean, I think I think it's safe to say that we're pretty global. <laughs> uh, uh, my impression from just the, the attendees of this session is is that so? So we've, we've got um, members from Europe and Asia, and you know the and the states and, and Canada. Um, I don't expect that to change. I think there's an awful lot of interest around the globe in this and um, a lot of interest in participating. So at least initially, if uh, we work towards a North America, uh, EU, Asia uh, presence, um, mm -hmm. either mirrored or, or uh, um, slave 
get repositories. So I think the other expectation would be, you know, you know what I think most open source, ex, you know, the expectation of open source would be that somebody does a pull request and that triggers a, you know, a build and a, oh, <clears throat> pardon me. I keep getting called by the school districts and I haven't had school age kids for 13 years. Um, I'm still uh, the one from the state I moved away from it two years ago. So yeah, I yeah that's, that's even worse. I, I still get the <laughs> emergency notices in my former town. Um, uh, was I saying? Oh, so so the expectation that you know it, it would fire off a you know a build and a you know a set of smoke tests and then maybe a set of you know the full set of unit and integration tests and so forth. Um, uh, you know, before people did reviews. I, I, I heard you mention Garrett. Um, you know, Garrett's one of those things that people either love or they hate. Um, yes. Uh, you know, we haven't had that discussion yet. Um, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I'm not sure that I necessarily have a preference. Um, and so it'd be interesting to get, you know, people's viewpoints, um, not only from the members of the TSC, but anybody in the community, um, whether or not Garrett is something they are familiar with and comfortable with and, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, the nice thing about it is it does provide a, an effective way of, of managing the need for reviews. And it also lets us figure out who's doing the reviews, right? This is something that, you know, Git doesn't do very well. Um, That's right. You know, Git's great about showing who's doing pull requests and so forth um, and who's doing the commits, but um, it doesn't really show us who's doing the reviews and, um, and tracking all those things. Uh, and it's not as effective, uh, you know, when you you know, submit a pull request and then somebody says you need to change it. Um, and Garrett can do a little bit better job there. But um, then again, like I said, it's also something that some people just plain hate. Um, uh, I'll admit to a personal bias uh, since I've been following all things blockchain in the last couple of years. I think some type of, of code review, whether you we choose Garrett or, or one of the other tools, Garrett's probably one of the most common uh, for Git repositories. Um, it certainly provides you a uh, somewhat bulletproof uh, way of, of tracking and tracing back, you know, code reviews and comments. Um, I think to some extent this project will have some of the same perceived security requirements like uh, maybe Let's Encrypt. Uh, project has, uh, and they found that that's been very helpful when, um, you know, God forbid you had an audit or, or anybody wanted to uh, to go to some type of audit template. I, I probably didn't mention it before, but I will mention it that that for all of our uh, all of our code bases, we do we do replicate those into a different site. Uh, that's part of the you know part of the full feature of the service, so that. Uh, Functionally, uh, all of the code is replicated out to a. a you, if it's not already, and we're talking about probably already having uh, regional distributions, uh, but if it's not already, it, it is uh, archived off, and uh, you know backups are kept, uh, you know automatically. Uh, it's just part of the service functionality. So. Hopefully, I've given you you guys enough uh, to kind of think through and chew on. Um, what I what we can do uh, is we can provide some some kind of graphical overviews uh, for the TSC to use in, in the discussions. Um, maybe you guys want to do a poll and get some feedback. Um, the, only, the only other question I would I would ask you at, at this stage of the game is there. 
is there any requirements uh, for testing? Um, and I'm going to use the word certification, but I don't mean it as in you get a physical certificate from somebody. Uh, but testing on bare metal, um, there are other projects we have, particularly the networking projects and the high security requirement projects, um, almost always have a uh, situation where they need to test on bare metal uh, to make sure that the throughputs and that the, the computational values are all still the same. Uh, so I mentioned that just in case it, it is an issue. It's something we, we certainly do now with many of our networking projects, but I'm, I, I'm not, uh, I have no idea uh, one way or the other whether it would be something that, that, that you guys would require and or need. Well, I, I, I can say that, you know, certainly from an IBM perspective, there will be interest in, uh, and I suspect also, you know, from other vendors as well, there, are, there will be interest in running on different platforms, right? So whether it's, you know, Power or Z or X86 or GPU, um, I think you know, there may be interest and ensuring that it, you know, builds and compiles and runs on all those various platforms. Um, and so, you know, again, from a consideration perspective, I think you probably have the same thing with Linux, right, where you probably build it out and test it on multiple different platforms, right? You know, there's two, there's two, uh, you know, kind of main thoughts about it. Um, one thought is, um, you know, build it, do a, a, a very aggressive CI testing unit test, uh, make sure it all hangs together, uh, set of testing, and then push out the release, and then let uh, the folks that are the early receivers of the release uh, do that kind of testing. Um, you know, you see it a lot in, in, in kernel or kernel derivative uh, kind of products where there's a lot of testing or there's a lot of uh, specific and big adjustment that goes on outside. In networking, it, it's a bit different. It, it ends up happening, you know, in both ways where in some cases uh, the functionality is so critical um, that uh, either uh, a vendor or manufacturer uh, uh, contributes equipment into the base or through the TSC uh, directs, uh, you know, the purchase of certain equipment that, that's tested on an ongoing basis. You know, that allows the frequency of the testing to go up significantly and allows establishing a baseline of, of how, this is, how this is running against, a, uh, if you will, a gold copy of the equipment. Um, I don't know enough about the profile uh, of the Hyperledger project and you know, whether that's a value or not, but I mentioned it to you um, just in the sake of, of, you know, knowing that that's a capability that we possess and it's a, it's a capability we've executed effectively on uh, to date. Uh, nobody ever wants to have physical equipment. Uh, nobody ever wants to be the guy that ends up having to support the physical equipment, but we we do do it now. So if it's advantageous to your project and it will help the doctrines in the community, then it, it's a, just another tool that you know we'll make available to TSC to help your success. So I, I'm neither promoting it or not promoting. I'm just saying it's it's a it's yeah. a feature and it's a, something that's available if you need it. Any. Any questions for Steve? I'm curious about, you know, just to maybe get a, a sense from those on the TSC uh, in term, and actually any, really anybody should feel free to speak up or put it in the chat on, you know, use of Garrett or not.
does everybody know what Garrett is? <laughs> Steve, maybe, actually, maybe, so maybe people aren't uh, completely clear. So maybe if you could just briefly describe Garrett and what it does for you. and Sure. Uh, Garrett's a... Uh... Here it's a tool that's that has historically been integrated in with the with GitHub and the Git repositories, and it it basically allows a control process around um, um, uh, code review. So uh, when you use Garrett, uh, you end up in a situation where um, the code gets checked in. Uh, they're pre pre uh, uh, configured. Uh, requirements that it will go through some type of, of review um, and it literally enforces the fact that it requires uh, you know two committers XYZ you, you can configure it in a variety of different ways that there uh, you know that there that code does get reviewed and it gets scored and passed or it gets failed um, in which case, uh, you know, it goes back to the drawing board. Uh, you know, the, the it gets punted, if you will, and uh, goes back for, for further review. It's part of the uh, it's part of the uh, ecosystem that comes with Git. So it's it's very common that the the point that was made of, of folks that either love it or hate it uh, is just absolutely valid in that. Uh, I think by nature, uh, developers either like code review or don't like code review, and um, uh, that almost always has a, a factor on whether they think it's a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, but it's, uh, I'd say it's a very flexible tool in getting the, the, the type of reviews you need um, to, uh, to, to have, you know, be able to uh, be confident that you have more than one set of eyes. Um, uh, on the code before it actually gets committed for, for the CI infrastructure to pick it up and, and get things going on. Right, and, and but not only that, but I mean it also sort of eliminates the potential for you know random code to be merged into the space. You know, right? to the to the to the to the um, to the extent that it can, it does uh, eliminate any. Uh, and and I, let's not assume malicious intent, but but just uh, mistakes getting introduced yep. into the code that requires unraveling. Yeah, hi, so this is Dave. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think a, a project of our nature, we should at least start off with something like this, and. Uh, you know, if we run into lots of complaints or issues, you know, we could talk about them and if there's alternatives, but I mean, we need to have something in place that shows evidence of code reviews and, and manages those type of potential issues, that's my view. I would think, uh, you know, my, my opinion is I think it would be, um, it would certainly uh, contribute to the perceived integrity uh, of the project. And uh, you know the, the quality of the code coming through. That's typically you know the highest value. You know, obviously code review has, has value in itself, but as far as perceptions by other people contributing or, or participating in the project, it certainly gains that. The other thing uh, that I've seen over the uh, history of several projects, it also bubbles to the top um, the folks that are really skilled in uh, I'll use a particular term, grokking, or understanding the code base uh, from a holistic viewpoint. Because what you'll find is, you know, in any system you have false positives, somebody does a code review, they think it's good, it turns out to be bad, then, then you've got a problem in the reviewer. Um, the reviewer looks at it, they fail it, turns out that it's really good, then you've got a problem with the reviewer. It bubbles those kind of things up to the surface really quickly. Um, and uh, allows you to adjust, you know, who's doing the reviews, who's, who's available for review, uh, more importantly, who needs to be reviewed on a regular basis. Um, so all of those are uh, twit knobs that you can adjust as, as part of the system. 
And I, I, I think, I think, Steve, I think you know that's exactly right, and it does sort of help identify who, you know, some who the leaders are. And it also, actually, you know, because you're you're sort of formalizing the review process and making it, um, you know, an integral part of what we do here. Um, you know, it, it gives actually another way of, of participating. You may not have enough uh, cycles to be developing code, um, but you may have the cycles to be able to review it. Um, and um, well, true. So, and yeah. uh, you know, there's, yeah. there's certainly projects where some of the, the folks that are really good at architecture uh, and may have at least two other full-time jobs. Uh, contribute review review time on a regular basis to make sure that uh, you know uh, the design parameters for the project are, are being maintained. So that's not unusual to see in a project at all. Any other thoughts? So we've heard from from Dave, and I think it was Mick. Who else? I'm fine. So you think that Garrett would be a good idea is what I'm asking. I, I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat, please? I'm, I'm, I'm basically sort of putting on the table, do people have um, strong opinions one way or the other about Garrett and would they agree that, you know, introducing uh, Garrett into our process would be a good idea. So let's just put it that way. So do people agree that introducing Garrett would be a good thing? Or not? I mean, just trying to get a sense. Well, I, I'm thankful generally for your expertise, but I really don't know what I decided. Well, maybe uh, maybe we'll have folks have a chance to uh, uh, once again for our viewpoint, it's it's just the tool. Uh, so if you guys want to uh, take that away, something to discuss and review, that that works for me. I, yeah. I Steve, think are you going to be at, Steve? Are you going to be at the face-to-face -face next week? Uh, I'm I'm kind of tentatively. Uh, scheduled to be there. Uh, it, I can either myself or one of my uh, uh, one of my uh, IT managers can you know have made arrangements to kind of be in if we need it. Um, maybe we could think about maybe another. All right. Maybe we could think about maybe another lunch and learn that you know we could demo Garrett because again I think some people may not be familiar with it um, and. Um, So maybe, that, maybe that's another topic that we could entertain for Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? I mean, I'm I'm kind of surprised that we're not hearing others weigh in. It usually elicits stronger reactions one way or the other. But yeah, uh, I was kind of why. expected. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's you know, just you know. I, I I gather is Garrett then used for the kernel? Um, no, we have we have other beasts that come into play with the kernel. <laughs> oh, the dictator. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, Strong personalities yeah. are involved there, so that that's a different right. animal entirely. All right, but I I mean, it is used I think very effectively. You know, from from my experience uh, with OpenStack, and again, OpenStack is it's huge. Right. I mean, they deal with um, what do they have? Sixty. Th I think no. Forty thousand patches merged for the Liberty release, which is just insane. Um, and each one of them has to be reviewed, and you know, two people have to plus to it that are core reviewers and so forth. And and you know, really, you couldn't manage a project like OpenStack without it. Uh, exactly. Uh, once a project reaches a certain threshold, the 
the amount of chaos that gets uh, it gets uh, introduced with you know without code review, it just just becomes unwieldy. But it's you know, the ability. To, oh, sorry, I'm speaking over Stan. Hey, sorry, this is Dan from CME. So I just wanted to kind of say that I think it's a great idea to have this for the project, especially this uh, uh, with this many potential contributors. But I think there's a risk in setting it up this early, with it being seen as a barrier for contributions. So it is a great thing to have something like this, but there's not enough um, uh, you know, ready code base. Maybe when it's already uh, after the face-to-face, -face, after the hackathon. Uh, once we have the uh, more or less final form for the project, after that having it set up, but initially before we have a single line of code for the final product, so to say, it's uh, it could be too early. And like I said, I'll repeat myself, I think it could be seen as a barrier for contributions. Well, this this is, and I, I agree with uh, Stan. I think I not, I I personally favor code review, but my only concern is I feel sometimes it slows uh, things down if you know reviewers aren't very active and quickly uh, reviewing stuff, getting back to people. So I just want to make sure that you know we're we're making an effort to review everything that comes in as quickly as possible. So I, I think, you know, to your point, Shan, um, you know, that is uh, obviously a concern, but it also then points to the need to have more reviewers. Um, and, uh, and again, I mean, it, it, you know, a tool like Garrett is going to help us understand when there's an increased need, um, whereas if we just use GitHub um, pull requests and so forth, it, it can be a little bit harder to discern whether or not there's a lack of reviews or, you know, what the reason for, for things languishing. Um, so anyway, I, I, I suggest people think about it. Maybe, um, uh, maybe we can see if we can, you know, schedule something for, for next week to go over Garrett so that people um, can actually see it in action and um, and see what it does, and, uh, and we can have a, a longer discussion about the merits. So we have uh, thanks, thanks, Steve. By the way, um, so we have eight minutes left. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you're on still. If you want to give us an update on where we are with those yes, I'm on. Yep. Can you hear me? You're great. Yep. Okay. So uh, the link to the status went out in the minutes. I'll post it again uh, here. I've just posted it. Um, so we have uh, about 15 work group members. Um, we have a, we're developing a template uh, for the use cases. Uh, the, the thought was we would start with, with, uh, with use cases and putting them in a standardized format. Um, that format is mostly borrowed from uh, OpenStack. Um, there's, a, there's a pointer there in the, uh, there's a link there. Um, to the to the template, uh, we're not we haven't finalized it, but we're working on it. One thing I would like to to call to your attention is in the template there's an area called characteristics. We're saying you know explain the user story relative to each of these characteristics, and we've tried to list several interesting characteristics of of uh, blockchains, uh, trade offs and choices that that need to be made uh, in, in blockchains. We think so. You might be interested in that list, and if you see anything. That looks wrong or should be added, you know. Please, uh, please let me know. Okay. Now, um, so we're, we'll build up a collection of um, use cases. We're not going to, you know, formalize it with organizing them by industry yet until we have those use cases. Then maybe we'll do that. Um, we're looking uh, for for use cases. Obviously, uh, we've got uh, some from IBM's uh, repo. Uh, so we'll, we'll use those. We've got one from SongTrust for the music publishing industry. Um, I've heard there were several discussed in the first meeting of the Hyperledger face-to-face, uh, -face, but I have yet to be able to find those. So if anyone has the minutes for those meetings or the use cases that were discussed, I'd like to get them. And then um, 
we do plan on doing a breakout session or more multiple breakout sessions next week at the face-to-face. -face. I realize not everybody uh, will, will be there, but for the people that will be there, we'll do a breakout. And I'll talk to Todd and see if I can get some, some telecom support. We could do some kind of telecom meeting. We will begin formal uh, regular meetings following the face-to-face, the -face, though. Um, I, I would like to participate in the kickoff um, next week, and actually I'd like to participate in a lot of the, the, the programming as well, So, um, and I see other people on the list that I think may want to as well. So I will uh, send an email to the group about how we're going to uh, schedule uh, work to the, the parallel track uh, and who would be able to participate. Any questions or comments? Not hearing any. Um, so, thank you, Patrick. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I really hope that we can get you know people engaged in this, uh, as well as in the in the white paper. Um, I think it's important, especially, to start coming up with uh, because Patrick is absolutely right. There were a number of sort of non-financial use cases that were discussed. I don't recall. Todd, that there were minutes that captured the, the specifics of those. I think we we're at a little bit of a higher level with the minutes, but um, I know that you know Hitachi had expressed uh, interest in some non-financial use cases, for instance, that did I think Accenture. Okay, well, I also that's great, and I also like to get the financial ones, um, commercial paper. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I think, yeah, I'm not suggesting the financial ones are not important. They are. Uh, but I, I also know that there are, there were a number of uh, use cases that, that aren't necessarily completely represented uh, in the TSC itself. So, uh, OK. So uh, this is Ram uh, from Cisco. Um, do we have uh, a tentative? Uh, uh, you, you know, um, agenda plan for the other tracks, the requirements tracks, and the um, um, and the um, white paper and architecture tracks. Well, I was thinking, and again, if people think that this is mistaken thinking, I'd like to hear about it. But I was thinking that it's likely to be, case, be the case that those that are interested in doing use case and requirements uh, or participating in the development of the white paper are a different set of individuals than those that would be actually hacking. I could be completely wrong, and maybe there's a lot of overlap there, but I was kind of expecting that there would probably be at least two tracks. Um, one that was a developer track, right, um, uh, where people are going to be actually hacking on some of the problems that we kicked around a little bit earlier with Sheehan, um, and collaborating you know, together coming up with solutions and running tests and, and, and so forth, and then and, and actually committing to the code base. And then there would be uh, a separate uh, track or, uh, or potentially two tracks. I think it's probably one, though, based on the what, what Dave was suggesting a little bit earlier, where requirements and use cases can be discussed um, maybe in you know small breakouts focusing on one industry or another. Um, and then, you know, bringing that together, refining them, agreeing, building consensus, and so forth, um, uh, as well as potentially work on the white paper. And then we would bring everything back together on Friday. So I would expect that, um, you know, after the, the first morning when everybody is sort of in, um, you know, the sort of the, the preliminary part of the agenda that I discussed, um, but the, you know, starting Tuesday afternoon, working through Thursday, that there be these separate tracks. That makes sense, uh, and I agree with the approach. Uh, just try to see whether we need the entire three days for the parallel tracks, uh, or if we have a plan, um, uh, kind of um, for the uh, um, requirements, white paper, architecture track, then. Um, you know, that'll be good to kind of plan uh, our time there. 
Right. Th this is fine. Well, I mean, all the use cases and sorted out and completed by, you know, before Thursday, I'll be very surprised. But um, I think there's tons of work to do. And even once you start identifying what they are, then, you know, obviously you can start drilling down and getting, uh, you know, getting some progress on uh, refining them and, um, and so forth. So, I mean, I... I would expect that there's a full slate of work to be done there, especially from the requirements in these cases perspective. Okay. All right. Well, we're at end of job. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Steve, again for uh, coming and enlightening us on the, uh, the infrastructure. And uh, thanks, Todd, and everyone for coordinating and we'll talk to you, well hopefully we'll see many, many of you next week and certainly talk to you uh, on, on the call next week. All right, thanks everyone. All right. Thanks Chris, thanks Todd. Thanks. Bye.